Hi folks, hope you're okay today, it's good to be with you. We're looking at this book, A Battle for the Bible. And uh, don't forget my website, jasonbirdspreacher.com. And uh, don't forget to uh, look at Twitter and Facebook uh, and of Royal Blood Ministries as well. So we've, we've still got quite a bit to go through. But it's good to be with you today. So how the books of the Bible were brought together. We read in this book by the Battle of the Bible by David Marshall. We read the books of the Old Testament. A great teacher wrote, few realise that the Church of Christ possesses a higher warrant for her canon of the Old Testament than she does for her canon of the New. The point he was making was that Jesus quoted and attributed the authority to all parts of the Old Testament and to his disciples after his resurrection. He said that everything that had happened to him was fulfilled in the Old Testament prophecy. Messianic prophecy was scattered throughout the Old Testament, of course, because it had yet been written, he could not give similar weight to the authority of the New Testament. The course of a clean-up in the temple in Josiah's reign, the book of the law was discovered. The book was presented to the king and he read it. It had, he realised, been lost owing to the indifference of his predecessors. In former times it had been kept in the tabernacle, then the temple and the priest frequently read from it. The king had a copy, a second copy, and the recovery of the book of the law was seen by the king and later chronicles, and as, a, and as an event of great significance, the king read passages aloud to the people. The portions that were read came from Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28, 29. From this it may be deduced that the book of the law represented the five books of the book Bible, or at least part of them. The rediscovery of the book was used as a springboard to the reformation of the kingdom. During the 70 years of the exile, the words of the prophets then extant came to be valued a great deal and the nation had ceased to exist, and with its capital and its temple. But there was still the book of the law and there was the books of the prophets. The Jewish Talmud assert that Ezra, who led the people at the end of the exile, undertook the collection and editing of the law of the prophets. It also suggests that a great synagogue was convened and that over the period of years all the law prophets of the writings came under discussion. In addition to any work carried out by Ezra, many scholars have suggested that over the decades members of the Greek synagogue undertook the work of editing. The Old Testament books are usually divided into four sections, the Pentateuch, the Book of Moses, the historical books Joshua to Esther, the five books of poetry and ethics Job to the Song of Solomon and the books of the prophets Isaiah to Malachi. The work of forming that we call the Old Testament at thanks to Ezra and the Greek synagogue began as early as 450 BC. Most scholars now accept that by the time of Christ the Old Testament existed in the form we, can, we have outlined. Following the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70 there was considerable discussion about the canon of the scripture. A rabbi called uh, Yojanan Ben Zakia obtained written permission from the Roman authorities to convene the Council of Germania in order to discuss the canon of scripture. However, the debate at the council simply centered around four books that were considered to be marginal, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, the Song of Solomon, and Esther. When the pros and cons with regard to these four books had been discussed, it was decided to include them within the canon along with the rest of what we know as the Old Testament books. In fact, they could have done little else. The books which they decided to acknowledge as canonical were already generally accepted, although questions had been raised about them. The Council of Germania did not invest the books of the Bible with authority by including them in some sacred list. They were included in that list, the canon, because they were already acknowledged as God-inspired authoritative and had been, in the most case, for a number of centuries. A contemporary of Christ, Philo of Alexandria, accepted the Old Testament canon in the form in which it is accepted today. The same is true of 1st century Josephus Flavius, 
the earliest list of the Old Testament books extant was drawn up by Mel Melitor, Bishop of Sardis, about AD 170, and is preserved by Eusebius in the fourth volume of the Ecclesiastical History. So I just want to mention a few things about the Old Testament. Because you'll read from many scholars that there were many other books that should have been in the Old Testament. And even um, there were many Old Testament, uh, many books that are not in the Old Testament that were written in the time, like Maccabees and, and other books, uh, that were written prior to the time of Jesus um, and were seen as authoritative. This is what many scholars would say, and they can cite quotations of these books being quoted uh, as scripture. Uh, so therefore, if they were quoted as scripture, they must have been seen as part of the canon. So the fact that they're not in the canon of the Old Testament now shows there's been like historical or political meandering going on. So how do we answer that? Well, I think the writer here, uh, David Marshall, uh, gave... The answer, really, I think you have uh, three clear lines of evidence. You have Jesus' quotations, you have Philo's quotations, and Josephus' quotations. And so you have a three-chord witness to what the authority of the Old Testament was. So there are texts, there are quotations that are made, uh, but I think they're only minor issues. And because they're minor issues... Scholars have made the major issues and made theories and spun theories out, out of their head which are actually not based in reality. Uh, but I think if you've got Philo, you've got Josephus and you've got Jesus and the Council of Germania as well, uh, you've got good evidence to show that the Old Testament is what we have today. The books of the New Testament, these are three categories of the New Testament, the narrative books, the four Gospels and Acts, the letters, and the uh, apocalyptic book of Revelation, which stands on its own. Although it took only 50 years to write the New Testament, it took far longer for it to assume the form that it has today. Not until AD 367 do we find the New Testament books listed in exactly the present form. The list is contained in an Easter letter written by the Christian bishop Athanasius. Amen. The two and a half centuries or so between the completion of the last book of the New Testament and the list of Athanasius, there has been much discussion as to which books should or should not include in the canon. The Old Testament formed the scripture of the earliest Christians. Gradually, some Christian writings were placed on a par with it, not by any decree or council, but by common agreement of the faithful. The spiritual institution of the church came slowly to decide which of its writings uh, as canonical, canonical. Just some references here. G. A. Smith, Modern Criticism and the Preaching of the Old Testament. F. F. Brooks, The Book and the Parchments. G. G. W. H. Lamp, The Cambridge History of the Bible, Volume 2. J. B. Phillips, Ring of Truth. F. F. Bruce, again, The Book of the Parchments. In the two and a half centuries between the completion of the book of the New Testament and the list of Athanasius, there had been much discussion to which book should or should not be included in the canon. The Old Testament formed the scripture of the earliest Christians. Gradually, some Christian writings were placed on par with it, not by any decree of council, but by the common agreement of the faithful, the spiritual institution of the church, came slowly to decide which of its writings should be regarded as canonical. What brought about the common agreement of the faithful? What informed the spiritual institution of the church? The books disregarded from the Old Testament canon came to be called the Apocrypha. A further group of wrongly attributed books called the pseudo Pseudopigrapha were also disregarded. The Apocrypha contained history and wise sayings and the pseudo 
epigrapha contained a lot of magic and a little history. As we examine the books discarded from the New Testament canon, the New Testament Apocrypha, again, we sense the presence of supernatural guidance. The books included were those accepted as God-inspired and proven in their ability to help men and make Christ known. They were acknowledged to have been written by men close to Jesus and involved in the great first century adventure which took the Christian gospel to the limits of the then known world. A Greek contemporary of Athanasius spoke of the echo of a great soul and professed to hear this echo in the canonical New Testament books. William Barclay has written the ring of sub is to be found in the New Testament books. They carry the greatness of their faces. They are self-evidencing. That's from a liberal scholar. When the Bible translator G.B. Phillips came to compare the New Testament books with the writings which were excluded from the New Testament by the early fathers, he could only admire the wisdom. He continued, probably most people have not had the opportunity to read the apocryphal gospels and epistles, although every scholar has. I can only say that that in such writing we live in a world of magic and make-believe, of myth and fancy. In the whole task of translating the New Testament, I never for one moment, however provoked and challenged I might be, felt that I was being swept away into a world of spookiness, witchcraft and magic powers, such as abounded in these books, rejected from the New Testament. The self-evidencing point came across most powerfully when one reads the books that almost got into the New Testament but did not, books that were intended by the authors to be accepted but were not. In the second century, a number of books were written called Infancy Gospels. The four Gospels of the Canon provided a, a, a little detail on the first three decades of the life of Jesus prior to the commandments of his public ministry. These Infancy Gospels were intended to fill the gaps. The so-called Gospel of Thomas is supposed to give a record of the infancy of Jesus. The child Jesus, while at play, is represented as creating live spirals out of clay. And striking a dead small child who ran and crashed against his shoulder, Jesus, the apprentice carpenter, is depicted stretching wood beams like elastic and exercising an assortment and magical powers to no practical purpose. No one could possibly mistake this for scripture, nor has he. Scripture itself, well, they have. Uh, the Quran has used these false gospels, infancy gospels. <laughs> no one could possibly mistake this for scripture. Well, yes, Quran. Nor has he scripture itself, not, nor has he. Scripture is self-evidencing, and when you compare the gospels with these books, there is no question as to why some are in and others without agreement out. The line is clear cut, there is no room for debate. Immense care was taken to ensure that the people who had authored the books that were accepted into the canon had known Jesus personally. The hallmark of these men was that they were concerned to demonstrate that Jesus who did these things in the past is the living Christ who still does things. In the book of Acts, every single sermon finished with the fact of the resurrection for the New Testament, Jesus was above all the living Christ. Because the four Gospels writers were speaking about the living Christ, they gave a vastly disproportionate amount of space to the last week prior to his crucifixion and resurrection. The central concern of the disciples of Christianity, of Christian theology, is the death and resurrection of Christ, of Jesus. The books with this was not the central concern. We quite simply either not considered or deliberately excluded from the canon. We may well believe, says F. F. Bruce, that those early Christians acted by a wisdom higher than their own in this matter, not only in what they accepted but in what they rejected. What is particularly important to notice is that the New Testament canon was not demarcated by the arbitrary decree of any council. When at last the church cancelled the Synod of Hippo, in AD 393 listed the 27 books of the New Testament, it did not confer upon them any authority which they did not already possess. So, so what do we make of that? Well, 
I mean, uh, it's, it's a very interesting, succinct little introduction there, but uh, there's so much that could be said. Um, just go back to... The formation of the canon in the New Testament. Um, there's a key word there, uh, self-evidencing. Um, it's interesting to note that the people who used that, Barker, who's a liberal, um, J.B. Phillips, who was kind of liberal evangelical, F.F. Bruce, who was evangelical but not uh, Presbyterian, they used the word, all those three used the word self-evidencing of the New Testament which really you get from the Westminster Confession and uh, I think that it's a couple of points need to be made I think why is it that we have the New Testament a lot of uh, internet atheists and Muslims and many many other scholars and many scholars will say well the New Testament is like a political production, it was created by Constantine. This is a total fabrication, by the way. It's just total lie and total fabrication. The Gospels, for example, were already accepted right in the time, in the first, first century. For example, we have Tatian's uh, editing of the Gospels, four Gospels to make one Gospel, which shows that... Uh, the Gospels, four Gospels were seen as authoritative. We have um, early Gospel manuscripts. Uh, we have a P45 of the Gospel of John that goes into the first century, or just near the end of the first century. We have the allusions of Irenaeus and, and many other early church fathers about four Gospels. So in other words, what I'm saying is, we have this argument that the, Gospel, the, the New Testament is self-evidencing, but we then can show historically that it wasn't just a council that said this is these are the New Testament, that there was this kind of general acceptance in the church of what was authoritative because the Gospels were self-evidencing and the New Testament was self-evidencing. And so I've, I've proven that by showing you a variety of information on the four Gospels, but you can do the same with other books of the New Testament as well. Now, there might be questions concerning... Um, yeah, so I think there's a couple of other things that need to be said. Right early on, uh, we have uh, Origins list. What that list shows us is that right early on there was a general acceptance of what the New Testament was. There were debates about the book of Revelation and debates about one or two other books like the book of Hebrews, etc. But those debates had particular reasons why there were those debates. For example, the book of Revelation, there were debates about that because um, it was seen as authoritative by everybody as the word of God, but then heretics were using it to say certain things. So that made everybody wary, well, why are they heretics using it? right? So then questions, doubts came in about the book of Revelation. But, Prior to that, it was already accepted. So, a skeptic like Muslims, like Mansour, or uh, some Muslim skeptic or an atheist could come along and say, ah, yeah, yeah, uh, the book of Revelation was not seen as the word of God. Well, no, it's a bit more complex than that. Yes, it was, but there were debates, and these debates caused problems, right? Secondly, the, the, they didn't have the internet then. They didn't have newsflash. So... You know, sometimes the early church father's knowledge was a bit patchy sometimes. So, for example, uh, Origen, uh, when he travelled to uh, certain places in the Holy Land, uh, believed certain texts might be the word of God, but when he went to certain parts of the Holy Land, he realised that he found information that able to show him that, no, he, he need to, needed to question some of the things he'd been saying. So, you know, in other words, you know, information didn't travel as fast as it is today. Sometimes the other church fathers were a bit patchy on some of the thinking. 
uh, because of the the, the uh, spread of information was not like it was today. But when you allow for that, that helps you to understand why sometimes there are some difficult questions, like why uh, are some early church fathers quoting from non-canonical books, for example. The other thing as well is when you look at the quotations, uh, by far the New Testament, by the early church fathers, by far the New Testament quotations are without a shadow of a doubt the vast majority of their quotations and, and of what they see as authority. It's just a few times there are these anomalies that make you think well what's going on here and a lot of it's due to uh, the lack of spread of information. Okay. You know, so for example if there's one area in Gaul where some bishop is quoting um, quoting uh, some book that's not the New Testament and then you've had a, a group of bishops that have, have read it in another area and condemned the book and said no it's not canonical it's not it's not the right book the other bishop in the other area uh, uh, has not heard the information yet but when he hears the information then he stopped quoting that book yeah or when he realizes that no wait a minute everybody else is quoting from Romans and these different books, they're not quoting from that book, but information didn't spread as fast. So sometimes things were a little bit patchy, alright? So I hope that's a help. Okay, thank you for listening and God bless you.